Welcome to History Hack. If you didn't know by now, we are the revolution. That means we're sharp, witty, lots of fun, but it also means that we're essentially the peasants in Les Mis huddled round a table in the corner of the bar with no money. If you enjoy the show, please do support us. We have a Patreon account by which you can donate a small monthly sum in appreciation of what you're hearing. Alternatively, we have Ko-fi in which you can just do a one-off donation as a thank you if you particularly enjoy a certain episode. Either way, we massively appreciate all of your support. Hope you enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of History Hack. I've got Mr. Locke with me today. Hello, Lockie. Hi, how are you doing? People should know by now, right, when they hear that you're here with me, what's coming at them? you got to, you got to know that the, the First World War, some element of it, is not too far away, haven't yeah. you? Um, no different this time. Um, we've got a, some scheming and intriguing to uh, to talk about, hopefully, because uh, Ronan McGreevy uh, is with us, and he's a man who's written pro- prolifically on Ireland in the First World War, uh, including the Easter Rising. Uh, he's on the staff at the Irish Times, and he's with us to talk about his latest book, The Great Hatred, which examines the assassination of your friend and mine, Field Marshal Sir Henry Wilson. Ronan, how are you? Great, Zach. Thank you very much for having me. Really appreciate it. Brilliant. Uh, There was an element of sarcasm there about Henry Wilson (laughs) being our friend. Uh, We like Haig. Uh, We like Britain. Uh, I love Kitchener. So I, I have my issues with Mr Wilson or Sir Wilson. Uh, but we're here today because you can't ignore him. Even if you don't like him very much, you can't ignore him, can you, Lockie? No, not really. Uh, <laughs> he writes from 1914 to 1918. He's part of the story and even before the Great War gets going. So I'm, I've been looking forward to this for a little while. Yeah, actually. definitely. Um Okay, Ronan, let's let's get going then. Um, sure. For those who don't know, for the uninitiated on this man, Wilson, uh, Anglo-Irish British Army officer, Ulsterman, uh, wasn't he? I mean, can you tell us a bit about him? Well, he was um, he was certainly Anglo-Irish, uh, uh, Alex. He was from uh, Banlalee, County Longford, which is, Ironically enough, uh, one of the heartlands of Irish nationalism, uh, it's in the south, which is interesting. Um, he identified as an Ulster man uh, because his family had been in Ulster since the William White Wars of the 1690. But um, actually, he wasn't actually temporarily from Ulster. He was from the south, which I think explains his reaction to the Anglo-Irish Treaty. Uh, he felt that Southern Unionists were being, like himself, were being abandoned. Um he had a very uh, he had a very typically Anglo Irish uh, background. He went to uh, um, Mar- Marlborough College, and uh, uh, he then uh, failed every exam. He went to several times for the army. Uh, got in the back door through the militias and uh, and to the Royal Irish Regiment, and rose up by uh, dint of both uh, ability and uh, by intrigue and by um, his ability to uh, garner good friendships to become the chief of the Imperial General Staff in February 1918, which was the professional head of the British Army. He, um, oh, he's a bit of a Marmite character, isn't he? Um, you mentioned intrigue. He, he is the best bitch in the British Army for me in the higher ranks um, in terms of the intrigue and the bitchiness some of his quips are hilarious Um, but he's prolific I think it's important to say more as an army administrator than as a fighting general isn't he Um, yes I love Marmite I don't love Wilson Uh, so tell us because I am completely colored by this tell us what we can credit him with up to the end of the first world war Well, we can credit him with uh, the preparations that the British Expeditionary Force had for the First World War um, when he was director of military operations. uh, He um, it was he who uh, um, drew up. It's probably his greatest single achievement. He was he who drew up the sort of logistical plans for uh, six divisions of the British Army, which was a small force at the time in comparison with the French and German armies. But still, it had. A, 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 a very uh, good effect on the morale of the French nation to deploy on the left of the uh, French uh, uh, army in, in, in the coming conflict against uh, Germany. Um, 
the uh, British Expeditionary Force was able to deploy uh, within three weeks of, of, of war being declared, it all went really, really smoothly. Um, he had mapped out a plan for the, the Royal Navy and the French French um, Railway Service to take to take um, to take the, the the British Expeditionary Force to be deployed on the the, the left flank of the French um, Army. He had spent many many years um, warning about the threat that that Germany posed, and he was of course uh, somebody who believed in. Um, uh, conscription long before it was popular or, or implemented in the UK, so I think uh, I, I think even his uh, most uh, ardent detractors would give him credit for his far sightedness uh, when he came to um, you know showing how the British Army would be deployed once a, a European war broke out. Yeah, I, I would have to agree with that, wouldn't you, Lockie? And I think it's important to say as well, as far as relations with the French go, he is the ultimate francophile, isn't he? Yes, he was the ultimate. Francophile. He was um, he was brought up. Uh, he was educated at home in in County Longford by uh, French governesses who, uh, and he became a lifelong Francophile in a in a very monoglot uh, uh, British army. It's fair to say he he um, he had a friendship uh, that extended before the war with Ferdinand Foch, who would go on to become the Allied Supreme Commander in uh, 1918. And the, the pair worked very well together. So chiefly, uh, Wilson's role during the war was as a liaison between the French and British uh, forces. And as we know, um, that was kind of haphazard and ad hoc and all the rest of that until um, until I think the, 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 the German Spring Offensive of 1918 concentrated the minds of the Allies as to how close they came to defeat. So... After that, obviously, you have the Joint uh, Allied Command and uh, you have uh, the war won, essentially, in 1918 uh, at a time when you know, most most uh, most uh, commentators uh, believe that it would take um, take until 1919 for the, the weight of American forces to, to, to bear on the German German positions. So, I mean, the, the kind of the coalition element then is clearly a strength of his. Um and I guess you could say it's a, it's a sharp appointment then in 1918, having him um, working with Foch, uh, Supreme Commander. When we get to the end of the war, where does he go next? You know, we've got, we have the victorious allies. Um, yes. there's the, 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 the coalition doesn't need to be held together anymore. So what's next for Wilson after that? Well, um, you know, he's still the, uh, you know, his problems don't end on Armistice Day. I mean, Armistice creates a new set of problems for him. You have the largest army that Britain has ever assembled in any field. Seven million men have to be demobbed. And then you have all the problems, the post-war problems. Uh, you know, we were inclined to think of the, the the sort of height of the British Empire being the 19th century. But actually, the British Empire was never as big as it was after the First World War because you also had mandates uh, in, in, in the Middle East and you had uh, huge problems in Egypt and uh, Iraq or Mes- Mesopotamia as it was then. Um, I mean, you know, you talk about Ireland at that stage uh, being a problem as well. But like there was problems across the empire and there was also problems in India as well. There was a separatist, uh, uh, separatism was growing there, especially after, after the Amritsar massacre. So you had all that. Then you had the deployment of British troops in, 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 in Russia uh, uh, as part of the uh, White Army to, to, to face off against the Bolsheviks, which, which um, uh, Wilson bitterly opposed. Uh, Wilson said that you know we sh- that Britain should stick to the countries that it owns, uh, in commas, inverted commas, and, and and stay out of the the business of other countries. So I mean, it was far from it was far from easy sailing after 1918. Um, you know, you had uh, the, the you had extra responsibilities for the British Empire, and you also at the same time had the demobbing of men who expected a lot better from their lives, having sacrificed so much uh, in, in the First World War. I think it's a real kind of serious business that people misunderstand, don't they? We hit the armistice and everyone thinks that the guns fall silent and it's peace across Europe and it really, really is not. The fighting comes home in a lot of countries. You mentioned Russia, but there's revolution in Germany. And, um, and of course, fighting in Ireland uh, as well. Um, yeah. I mean, you got lots of uh, men with a, a strong desensitization to violence and um, and a healthy dose of P- PTSD come home, don't they? 
Absolutely. Well, I mean, you know, the 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 um, the, the first world war really was the uh, it was the end of the first world war, and it should be should be uh, I think noted that um, you know Ireland was part of the United Kingdom during the First World War. I, I, my last book was uh, wherever the firing line extends was about the Irish experience in the Great War, which has really only now been um, uh, uh, properly uh, excavated, so to speak. So I mean, there was. 40,000 men from the island of Ireland killed in the First World War. 30,000 actually from what is now the 26 counties of the Republic of Ireland. So like, I mean, the, the Irish have played a full part in the First World War for, for good or ill, but but that's not the end of it. I mean, as soon as the war is over, within a month, um, uh, there was a declaration of independence by the Irish Parliament. Have, uh, all those who had won seats in the Westminster Parliament election of December 1918, they declare uh, an independent Irish state, um, set up an independent Irish parliament on the same day, which is the 21st of January 1919, the Irish War of Independence begins. So you have, uh, for the next two and a half years, uh, you have a conflict between Britain and Ireland, between the IRA on the one hand and British Crown forces on the other. And of course, uh, Wilson will have a, a, a great personal interest in, in this conflict, um, given that he's Irish himself, uh, but he's of the Unionist tradition. And I think he brings a particular Irish animus uh, to, 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 to the whole conflict. He, he, he's so emotionally connected to 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 the fight against the IRA that he can't really see beyond that. He can't see that this is some some kind of a a rogue um, offensive by a few uh, um, uh, misguided separatists. This is this is this is a, 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 a popular rebellion against British rule in Ireland. Uh, and Wilson is uh, inveigled in this, and he becomes a field marshal in June 1919. It's an honorary title, really, because he, as we have spoken about before, he didn't really spend a huge amount of time in the field during the First World War. But it's given to him for his um, for his role as 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 you know the, the for 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 all his his service to Britain in the First World War. But uh, is at that stage that he starts to fall out with the British government over Ireland. Um, he feels that uh, the Irish situation is a security situation that the British should uh, send in 40,000 men and crush the um, IRA. The British government is constrained by the fact that um, there was widespread international sympathy for Ireland, especially in the United States. And a lot of sort of liberal Britain is uh, horrified by the excesses of the Crown forces are sent to Ireland, the Black and Tans and the Auxiliaries, which are, as you say, a former British uh, servicemen who were sent to Ireland to to keep the peace, but actually end up um, uh, alienating the entire population. So there is a, a, a huge standoff between Wilson and the British government in, in this time period. I think um, what you're describing, I'm guessing, is what's referred to as the Orange Terror, um, which is so the orange side is, is the unionist, unionist side, isn't it? Um, yeah. So what is the orange terror uh, specifically? And and does Wilson play a role in it? Well, um, this is where it gets kind of complicated, because while, while the War of Independence is going on in the south of Ireland and what's now known as the 26 counties, now it is in 32 counties as well, but not to the same extent. There's effectively a civil war going on in the north as well. And it's um, it's an embryonic troubles, which has been largely forgotten about. It lasted from July 1922 to uh, July uh, 2022, where you have um, a, a unionist backlash against na- Irish nationalism. Um, it begins with the expulsions from the shipyards of Catholic workers and what's known as rotten prods, uh, left-wing Protestants. And uh, that starts uh, two years of blood- bloodshed, which leads to the deaths of over 500 people. It's it's a sectarian conflict. But the people who suffer most in it are the nationalist stroke Catholic population of, of the North. Um, they are uh, they account for twice as many um, uh, fatalities as 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 as, as Protestants, uh, even though they're, they're, the, the population is reversed. They're only a third of the population. And um, 
there is obviously a backlash. The Northern Ireland state is created in June 1921. Um, there's a backlash uh, uh, by Irish nationalists against that. Um, there are a couple of um, state uh, forces that are founded at this time, the Ulster Special Constabulary in particular, which is known, better known as the B-Specials. And they are in, meant to be the state forces to keep the peace. But actually, as far as most nationalists in the North are concerned, um, they are a force that are directly um, is directly uh, uh, opposed to them so you have a problem in the north with with um, with with sectarian violence as well and into this steps uh, uh, Wilson in March 1920 now just to fill you in the picture he his four-year terms as the chief of the imperial general staff six SIGs as is known ends in February 1922 within three or four days he's elected as unopposed as a Ulster Unionist MP for uh, North Down, uh, he sits on the Conservative benches at that stage. Many of the Conservatives are anti the uh, Anglo Irish Treaty, which had been signed in December uh, the previous year, setting up the Irish Free State. So straight away, um, uh, Wilson is is made the chief military advisor to the Northern Government of uh, Sir James Craig, the Northern Ireland Prime Minister, and he becomes associated in the minds, uh, Wilson becomes associated in the minds of Irish nationalists with the excesses of state forces in the North, the B-Specials, the RUC and the British Army. And so... Um, uh, the principal reason why he was shot, and we're going to come on to his assassination presumably in a few minutes, is because he's associated with the northern pogroms. He's associated with the pogroms against the uh, uh, nationalist Catholic pop- 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 population in the north. And uh, this is the principal reason why he's assassinated in June 1922. The, yeah, I mean, I'm now th- sort of thinking back into 1914 and, and Curra uh, a little bit, and actually his, uh, his, his role in, in stopping um, the British Army piling in uh, there. Obviously, that would have been against unionists there too so I guess he's not opposed to force in in some sort of sense and he clearly picks his side doesn't he well um, yes on that subject I mean he was uh, he was deeply involved in the current mutiny this was well it wasn't a mutiny as such because there was no um there was no order but it was it's known as a Curra incident uh, whereby um uh, the British government uh, has made contingency plans for, uh, in the event of Home Rule being implemented, that the British Army would would was, would, would keep order in the north. Um, there's uh, quite a few Anglo-Irish uh, uh, officers who are based in the Curra say they're not going to obey British Army orders. Wilson, who is director of military operations at this side, and then therefore, um, you know, one of the chief senior forces in the army uh, is intriguing on the side of the of those who won't uh, who won't um, uh, a march against who won't obey a British government order if it came to it, and. To be honest, uh, uh, it made it made Wilson uh, a, hu- a huge enemies in the British establishment, particularly among Herbert Asquith, the British Prime Minister, who regarded him as an intriguer and uh, a poisonous uh, roughen, as he called him. And uh, it, it, it's it's not it's it's not uh, coincidental that that uh, Wilson didn't become SIGs until uh, Herbert Asquith had left office in in December nineteen sixteen. Yeah, because Asquith was nearly ruined in fourteen. The First World War basically saved his premiership, didn't it? Um, yeah, yeah. He, was he was gone, I think. Yeah, and and Asquith, um, Asquith was the first person to pay tribute to to Wilson after he died. But Asquith had no time for Wilson. Um, he he regarded him as a gossiper, an intriguer, somebody who was trying to undermine the government. Uh, he wasn't far wrong there, uh, but. Um, I think that uh, Lloyd George saw in Wilson a sort of uh, a, a kind of a, a, a maverick spirit like he had. He, he regarded Wilson as very much self-made, um, very mercurial, like 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 Lloyd George. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he really, uh, Lloyd George put a huge amount of trust in Wilson. Uh, obviously, you know, as well as I do, how much Lloyd George despised most of the British generals, particularly Douglas Haig, but he seems to have had a soft spot uh, for um, Wilson, and, and that's why he made Wilson Siggs in, in February 1918. Kindred spirit, I suppose. Um, let's let's introduce a couple more characters uh, then, shall we? Um, Reginald Dunn, who's this? 
Reginald Don is the son of a British Army bandmaster, um, and uh, he is uh, uh, London-born. He's born in Woolwich Barracks in nineteen is in eighteen ninety eight. Um, he is a uh, Jesuit educated Catholic boy, deeply devout, um, who joins the British Army uh, on his 18th birthday in 1916. He joins the Irish Guards, so obviously he's got an Irish background. His mother's family is is from County Monaghan. And um, he is uh, wounded uh, during the German sp- uh, Spring Offensive of 1918 and invalided out of the army. And then in 1919, he is... Um, He's a musician, as I said. His father, his father was a bandmaster in the British Army. Um, he is a cultural. He becomes uh, interested in the Irish question, as they call it at the time, to his involvement with an organisation called uh, uh, Con- Conran Nagelga, which is um, an Irish language and, and music um, uh, organisation, which had a lot of branches in London. Um, he's completely radicalised. He joins the Irish Republican Army, the IRA. And, and also the Irish Republican Brotherhood, which is a secret organisation. He becomes, uh, with the zeal of the convert, he becomes um, uh, a completely messianic uh, supporter of Irish independence. He becomes the officer commanding the London IRA. And we now know, uh, thanks to files that have only been released in recent years, just how, how important the London IRA was in terms of the um, uh, 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 supplying guns to the IRA in Ireland and also in, in, in involving themselves in sort of a guerrilla campaign of, of burnings and arson attacks that really unsettled the population in, in London. And uh, he was also involved, I think it's important to state, in plans to assassinate the British cabinet, which, uh, which were first activated in 1918, but only acted upon when they shot Wilson in 1922. So he's a very intriguing character he's um he's an intellectual he's a catholic he's a devout catholic he's uh he, he he's um he's a deep thinker he uh he he wins prizes for poetry in school and he becomes a trainee teacher um uh, after after the war he also is in receipt of an invalid pension from the british government and uh so um, you know, he's not he's not really anybody's idea of who, who you would think would be a, a radical Irish nationalist. We also have as well, don't we, Joseph O'Sullivan. Joe Sullivan's from a more conventional Irish background, uh, whereas Reggie Dunn was an only child. Um, uh, uh, Joe O'Sullivan was from a more stereotypical uh, large Irish Catholic family. There was 11 uh, surviving children. His father was from Bantry County, West Cork, which is... Uh, sort of the heartland of Irish, uh, 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 the Irish Fenian movement. Uh, uh, but Joe Sullivan, uh, he has seven brothers. Six of them served in the First World War. Joe Sullivan uh, joins the London Regiment in 1915. It's interesting that he joins voluntarily as well. He's not. He's not. Uh, he's not conscripted. And um, he loses his uh, uh, leg at Passchendaele in, in August 1917. Uh, he is um, invalided out, obviously. He gets a job as a messenger in the Department of uh, the Ministry of Labour after the war. Um, and he's he's familiar with what, uh, what uh, Henry Wilson looks like because Henry Wilson is dropping into the Ministry of Labour to on business related to the demobbing of, 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 of former soldiers. Uh, so, uh, Joe Sullivan, too, joins the IRA in 1919, as does his brother Pat O'Sullivan, who's left a very, um, very long and interesting testimony about uh, the family's involvement in the uh, uh, the IRA. Um, he was from a, a, a family of master tailors. Um, Pat O'Sullivan writes about uh, in his in his in his in his um a letter for an Irish pension, how he had used his uh, tailor shop in Chancery Lane as a place to store guns for the IRA. He also uh, himself and Joe O'Sullivan and uh, uh, Reggie Dunn used their wound badges that they receive as First World War veterans to walk into uh, British Army barracks and steal rifles uh, and ammunition for the IRA. So they're two very intriguing characters. Again, very well educated by the standards of the time. They're both actually public schoolboy, so to speak. Um, uh, uh, Reggie Dunn goes to St. Ignatius College in, in London, and he is, believe it or not, a contemporary of Alfred Hitchcock, uh, whereas Joe Sullivan goes to St. Edmunds Wares College, which I think is in Hartford. 
Chair, which is the oldest uh, continuous Catholic school of Britain. Interesting. The, the point you make about know, knowing what Wilson looks like, I, I think uh, he had a fairly distinctive ex- uh, appearance, didn't he? And he, he had a, a face that even a mother would struggle to love. Um, yes, <laughs> yes I, 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 I struggled with that myself. But um, I think we have got to, to look back to the time before um, TV, before the internet, before uh, um, radio. I mean, just knowing what people look like is not that that easy. I mean, Michael Michael Collins managed to avoid British um, uh, British uh, intelligence for a long time because they had no photograph of him. So you might think, well, we know what Wilson looks like now, but it wasn't that easy back then. To um, there was a lot of mustachioed sort of uh, ex British generals uh, walking around the streets of London, and also another important thing was that they also knew his address, which is number thirty six Eaton Place, and I think that's really really important. It is bonkers, isn't it, when you think about it like that? It's just like, how do you even know that you've got the right guy as well? Because even like, yeah, you might have seen a portrait in a newspaper, yeah. but those portraits often don't actually look. That, I mean, they're supposed to give the best side. They don't. They're not like candid selfies, are they, Lockie? No, I think yeah, some of those portraits even make Wilson look, you know, really, really handsome. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, they managed to find some side of him that isn't quite as bad. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they, they had to, there's a very, there's an interesting story in my book about this guy called Carl Brewer, who, uh, who only is the centenary, he was one of the first, he was the first significant fatality of the Irish Civil War, but he was going around, um, they, 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 they had uh, built up a list of targets uh, that they were going to attack, including all the members of the British cabinet and people like Lord Rothermere, who was the uh, proprietor of the Daily Mail, etc. And he had them like football cards. I mean, he was looking, this is what these guys look like. And you think, well, Actually, you know, how would you know what these people look like unless you had photographs of them? And how do you go about you can't just buy a newspaper and hope they'll be there? You know, you have to you have to cut out the photographs, etc. So it wasn't as easy as people think to uh to 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 to, to target these people in those days. Okay, I mean, well, he, they've got his address then, they've they've got reason. <laughs> you know, having looked at the kind of politics behind it, we we've uh, we've got a bit of context here. Uh, is there any more to the assassination to, to bear in mind? Well, the thing about it is, is that um, obviously when you want to assassinate somebody, you have to have a motive and you have to have an opportunity, right? So the motive that I explained to you before was um, uh, Wilson's perceived role in the Orange Terror, as I described it. But what about the opportunity? So there's a meeting of the IRA. Uh, They are divided over the treaty, whether to support the Anglo-Irish Treaty, which sets up the Irish Free State. The meeting's held in June the 21st, 1920. June the 21st, uh, the evening of June the 21st in Mooney's Pub in, in Holborn, which I believe is still there. And in walks a guy, one of the, one of the, the officers with a photograph, with a, uh, with a copy of the evening news. And there in buried probably on page seven is a single paragraph, a, a news and brief, as we call in journalism, stating that uh, uh, Henry Wilson is going to uh, unveil a memorial at Liverpool Street Station the following day. Uh, and suddenly here we have, we know where Wilson is going to be. And so Reggie Dawn and Joe O'Sullivan, they look at this and they're, they're, they're thunderstruck, right? And they decide to repair to Liverpool Street Station to check, to, to check out the joint. They realise that they're not going to be able to kill this guy um, uh, at, at Liverpool Street. They're not going to be able to get away. So they wait for Wilson to unveil the memorial and they walk to his house. So he unveils the memorial at about a quarter to one. Wilson has a, a meeting in the House of Commons at around uh, uh, 3.30, so he's got to go home and change back into civilian clothes. And They're waiting for him on the doorstep of his home at 36 Eaton Place, and they shoot him six times and they kill him. So, um, And then you might ask the question, why on earth would you have a one-legged man um, as one of the assassins? Well, as I said to you, the opportunity, you had to take the opportunity when it came and this was the only opportunity they have. You know, you, in those days, you ju- you didn't know where uh, a politician was going to be from one day to the next. So uh, Joe Sullivan was available and he was willing to do it. So um, they shot him. But, uh, you know, they he, uh, um, Reggie Dunn is also a wounded veteran. They try to get away. They shoot two policemen uh, as they're trying to flee the mob that's chasing after them. But of course, eventually they run out of ammunition and run out of puff. So they're, they are um, 
uh, caught at Ebury Street, which is about six or seven hundred meters away. They're attacked by a mob. They're saved by the police, but the police take them to Jarrett Street Police Station and beat the hell out of them. And then they 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 um they they appear in court that evening. And of course, like it's a it's a slam dunk, really. I mean, you know, there's no way they're going to get away with this, so they're sentenced to uh, to be executed. Um, Let's leave them because I'm conscious of I want people to go and buy the book. So if you want to find out the full story of what happened to Donna O'Sullivan, go buy the book. But I do want to talk about um, the knock on effect of Wilson's murder. So first of all, how does the world react? Absolute shock and consternation. Um, you know, uh, we've had, I mean, I'm, I'm speaking to you today as the um, as we talk about the um, former Japanese prime minister has just been assassinated and you can imagine that the, the the world reaction to that and this is a huge shock in the UK I mean we're not talking about um, a backbench MP uh, we're talking about the former head of the British Army we're talking about somebody who is one of the men who wins the war as far as many of his contemporaries are concerned we're talking about somebody who was part of the delegation that uh, 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 negotiated the Treaty of Versailles and we're talking about the first assassination on British soil since 1812 so the prime minister in 1812 and i go into this in detail in the book how you know lots of countries in europe and of course the united states loses three presidents to assassination in the 19th and nearly 20th century it's just not the british way of doing things a political assassination is not the british way and so there's massive shock and consternation in britain also there's a belief that here we are you know i thought we had solved the british the irish question you know by setting up the free state there was supposed to be peace between britain and ireland and here you know the head of the british army the former head of the british army has been assassinated on the streets um, it makes worldwide headlines it's so it's the front page in practically every American newspaper the following day. Um, there's consternation in France as well. I mean, the, the, the British army is known in France as Le Armée de Wilson, the uh, Wilson army, and so on. And so all the Allies are, are really, really shocked by this. And it should be noted as well that two days after Wilson was assassinated, um, the uh, the German uh, uh, foreign minister Walter Rathenau was also assassinated. So the world is really reeling from the shock of all of this. And if you look at the uh, video footage, and it's you can Google it, or you can go to YouTube and see it of Wilson's uh, funeral. I mean, it's one of the biggest funerals that London has ever had outside a member of the British royal family. What about in Ireland? I mean, if, if there's consternation in the UK, is 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 the reaction similar in Ireland? Is there a sense of oh God, what's what's happened now? What's yeah, what's... there is really. I mean, there's a shock in Ireland about it too. Um, Arthur Griffith, who's the president of Dáil Éireann, effectively the leader of the state, says this isn't the way we do business. We, I mean, you know, I don't think you. I'd be letting you into any secret to say that the uh, vast majority of um, people in nationalist Ireland, at least. Um, had no time for Wilson and his views, but you know that that's one aspect of it. But to be assassinated the way he was on the streets of 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 London was a shock for the Irish government. Of course, it created a huge problem, which for the Irish government as well, because uh, the uh, and, and precipitated the civil war in the north. He's regarded as the first martyr of the northern state. Uh, by James Craig, the British, the Prime Minister, and it is interesting actually bringing it up to the present day that on the centenary of his um, uh, assassination, there was a, a, a plaque unveiled in the House of Commons chamber. I happened to be there at the time by the Speaker uh, Lindsay Hoyle and done by uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg, and the principal people behind that plaque were were the Ulster Unionist MPs, including and most particularly Ian Paisley. So he's still regarded in some ways as a martyr of the uh, for Northern Ireland, whereas in the South he's regarded as he was regarded as basically what she was, an enemy of Irish nationalism. I think as well, you you use a particular <laughs> phrase. Um why do you refer to his assassination as Ireland Sarajevo? Well, I think this is a very um, this is why this 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 uh, assassination is so sig- such a significant event in Irish history. So, going back to um, going back to the signing of the Anglo-Irish Treaty in December 1921, which sets up the Irish Free State, um, there's uh, the the Irish nationalist movement, the Sinn Féin uh, and the IRA at the time split over this. There are those who are willing to accept the treaty as a stepping stone for freedom, as Michael Collins uh, says, and there's those like uh, Eamon Debra who are opposed to it. They say that they want an Irish 32-county Irish Republic rather than Dominion status that still has the king uh, as the head of state. 
And this is a very, very serious impasse. And in uh, the, the IRA, which had uh, been the uh, which had fought the British to a standstill in November 1920 or July 1921, a split over this substantial portion of the uh, senior commanders in the IRA refused to accept the new Irish government, refused to accept the treaty. They occupied the four courts, which is like the old Bailey of Ireland in, of April in 1922. And they're still in situ in June 19, uh, by the time Wilson is assassinated in June 1922. To cut a long story short, the British government, whether um, uh, conveniently or not, blame the anti-treaty side uh, for the shooting of Wilson. They tell the provisional Irish government at that stage, headed by Michael Collins, that if if the um, if the provisional government doesn't deal with the anti-treaty rebels and get them out of the four courts, that the British government will come back into Ireland and do it for them. Uh, bear in mind that there's still a British garrison in Ireland uh, of about 7,000 soldiers. And... Um, the British cabinet is spoiling for a fight following the assassination of Wilson. Um, Winston Churchill, who's the Secretary of State for the Colonies, wants to send in the Royal Navy and the, the RAF. So there's a, there's, there's a danger here that we're going to reignite the war between Britain and Ireland. So the, so the Irish government is left in a difficult situation. Either it deals with the four court rebels and risks the possibility of a civil war, or it, uh, or it doesn't deal with them and risks uh, um, starting a war with Britain, which it can't really win um, because you just don't have the, the IRA has been degraded since the, uh, since, the, since the War of Independence ended. So it's a terrible dilemma for the Irish government. And uh, they, they take the path of least, least resistance and decide to deal with the four court rebels. And this, the, the shelling of the four courts on June the 28th, 1922, is the event that starts the civil war. So, getting back to the question about Ireland Sarajevo, we know that uh, we know that the First World War begins with the assassination of Franz Ferdinand in June 1914. This precipitates a, 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 an ultimatum from the Serbian go- or from the Austrian government to Serbia. So, if you substitute the British ultimatum to the Irish government, uh, you know Serbia doesn't can't um, can't agree with this uh, uh, ultimatum. So, basically, what what I what I suggest in my book is that without the Wilson shooting there would have been no Irish civil war and the history of Ireland would have been different. This whole period is absolutely fascinating and I love the historical parallels. I mean this this one with Sarajevo is, is something I think I think the violence reaching the streets in uh, in in Ireland is comparable with German Revolution uh, as well. Um, the use of political murder as a tool is just yeah you know, it, it's it's something that we yeah, as you say, it's kind of we should come back to us today with the with the Japanese former prime minister uh, as well. Absolutely, and and, and the, I, don't, I don't know if you've ever spoken to him, but there's a book by a, a German historian who's based here in Dublin by Robert Gerwarth called "Why the First World War Failed to End," and it's a brilliant. Uh, resume of, of all the um, uh, civil wars uh, that uh, that occurred after after the first world war he re- he estimates that in the four years after the first world war four million uh, people died in Europe uh, from various different civil wars and conflicts and that include uh, includes Ireland there's a cracking book actually he's, he's an excellent author I've got a few of his on the shelves they are very good yeah. indeed yeah um, it, and it's just so much to consider as well. I mean, uh, 1922, it, 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 politically, things spiral in the UK as well. And you have the, the big general election where Lloyd George is turfed out uh, as well. Maybe maybe that's kind of a, a a lead into what happens. But we're in danger of digressing uh, here. And well, I think I, it's I was... important. I mean, now that you mentioned it, Alex, I mean, obviously, you've all this... Uh... Uh, intrigue in in the UK at the moment. There was uh, I, there was somebody on Newsnight was making the analogy between Lloyd George and Johnson. I mean, Lloyd George was, as we know, a brilliant man in a lot of ways, self made, but also. Um, uh, uh, economical with the actuality, as you say, and he, he was brought down by several scandals, wasn't he? And of course, when we talk about the 1922 committee, what are we referring to? Well, we're referring to the Carlton House, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, mutiny against the, the coalition government at the time. So it's really interesting, I think, how history is repeating itself again, yeah. you know, 100 years on, not just in Ireland, but in the UK as well. And what's interesting is that George V tells Lloyd George, you can have this election right now in the aftermath of the war and you will win, but then you will get turfed out and you will never see power again. He actually predicts it. And Lloyd George just laughs at him like a silly little man with silly little beard. You don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, no, but he's, yeah. Hang on. 
Yeah, I just think if you think things yeah, are unraveling I think it's at the very moment. Interesting that, yeah, I mean, I, I, whether you agree with Boris Johnson or not, he is, a, he is a historically consequential British Prime Minister, as was Lloyd George. I mean, but I, I, I see huge analogies between between Lloyd George and, and Boris Johnson, um, although I think that that Lloyd George was much was much the more substantial politician, but nevertheless, I mean, what you're seeing in Britain at the moment has its parallels a hundred years ago, you know. And the Wilson shooting didn't help the move music either. I mean, it, there was talk at that time that it was uh, uh, that it was going to bring down the British government, but it certainly um, concentrated the minds of a lot of diehards in the Conservative Party who didn't really want the settlement with Ireland. And it's one of the reasons why I think that, that the the, the uh, Conservatives left government, not the only one or the principal reason, but it didn't help the mute music when the Conservatives left the coalition government in October 1922. So, um, yeah, very interesting, very interesting time and very interesting parallels with the present day, I think. Right. Well, I've loved this. I think it's been really, really interesting. Ronan, it's been excellent having you on. Um, just to uh, just run us through the, the, the name of your book and where people can find out more, please. Yes, it's my book is called Great Hatred, The Assassination of Field Marshal Sir Henry Wilson, MP. It's published by Faber and Faber in hardback and paperback, and it should be available in, in all good bookshops and on Amazon and uh, wherever else you can buy your books. It's, it, it should be available. Terrific. Well, thank you very much once again. It's been an absolute pleasure uh, having you. Thank, thank you, Andrew. And uh, it's, it's, been, I, 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 it's, been, it's been fascinating speaking to you guys, and I really appreciate the time you've taken to, to speak to me. When our guests join us to talk about their work and their new book, the 45 minutes or so they spend with us is just a taster of all their efforts. So to this end, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org where you can find our guests' latest and greatest books. You can support them, and you can support History Hack too. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep at it and bring you more amazing guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack, or just search on bookshop.org for us under the shops bit. Thank you for your continued support, and here's to your next great book.